Yes, now you can hear me. Wonderful. I think I shouldn't move that much. No, stay. <laughs> Good. Hello, everybody. Wow, this is a nice audience. And hi to everybody in the internet, the billions of people out there that are listening now. This is great. Um, this talk is about security theater. I'm sure you all have seen that before, no matter if you know the term or not. And uh, I decided to go to call it a praise of folly, and you will see quite some theater references in this talk. And it's also about the mostly unknown OZ, OSI lever, lever layer 8, and the layers above. So if you expect a technical talk, that's not quite what it's going to be. We're going to talk a lot about humans, human error, and examples for, yeah, for things that go wrong. I hope it's funny in some parts, and yes. For those who do not know, oh yeah, I'll have a question section at the end. If you want to interrupt me because I'm saying something that's simply wrong, feel free to do so. And for those who don't know the praise of folly, it was not far from here, Erasmus of Rotterdam, who in 1509 wrote these lines in his praise of folly that I really like. So if you go on a stage and take off the masks from the people who do the play, you would be thrown out of the theater. You would be hit by brickbats like a drunken disturber. And the whole life of mortals is exactly the same, he said. The various actors come in, once they are king, the next time they are just a drunken lunatic or whatever on stage. And Shakespeare also got this, all the world is a stage. So what I'm talking about is the security theater. I just start with three, four concepts that I want you to know of, then I'll tell you what I'll do. And who has heard of Cargo Cult? Great, good job. <laughs> I don't ask about Feynman because everybody knows him, I guess. So Cargo Cult is a term that means, that, that defines practices that make no sense, but that, uh, except for the fact that people believe in them. <laughs> and they do not follow scientific method. I'll have pseudoscience, pseudo, no, English, pseudoscience also in the, in the talk later. But there's also cargo cult IT or cargo cult programming or cargo cult IT security. So cargo cult programming, according to Wikipedia, is a style of computer programming characterized by the ritual inclusion of code or program, program structures that serve no real purpose. I will tell you about onion code later. Maybe you have heard about that too. There's a lot of anti-patterns around here also. If you want to read about cargo cults, uh, here's the link. All slides will be put up there. Um, there's a lot of memes and myths around, and you may know these pictures. They, are, they, they, they were all in my Google Plus stream somewhere, and um, references I can give to you. If, if you're the owner of the pictures, you don't want me to post them here, then just let me know. Um, this, is, this is, for example, one thing you hear. We, we put gates in places where they really make sense. We do pen test, uh, pen test, not pen testing, we do quality testing, QA. And we make sure that the little bug doesn't pass. Yeah? But one thing that we mostly forget is the user. Because the user will always try stuff and use the software you code in a way you would not imagine. <laughs> yeah? And security theater itself, according to Bruce Schneier, who I think coined the term, or at least he used it first, um, is about feeling. You may be totally insecure, but you may feel absolutely safe. But you may have exactly the opposite. Yeah? And I recommend this talk from Bruce Schneier. It's called The Security Mirage. It's a TED, and it's wonderful. Um, as I said before, this presentation is meant to be understandable. Please don't lynch me for when I'm, if I'm talking about technical stuff in a very, very short way or uh, there's wrongness in it. Um, I want this un un understandable also for children and managers. And uh, that's a reference to another book I have later. <laughs> um, since three years, I am a manager, so... <laughs> 
Um, I've got, as you saw, I have some hopefully funny openers, then a few words about me. The openers I have already passed. Um, some definitions of security and security theater, followed by a technical explanation of the OSI layers, the other ones, yeah? And uh, the main actors, plots, and of security theater. Then the, the painful part comes with lots of examples. I can go into detail there more or less, depending on the time that we have. And um, then I have some uh, examples. No, after the examples, I'll have some short analysis and suggestions that we might, that we as open source community should probably start discussing about. I have a video announcement from Julia Reda from the Pirate Party of the European Parliament, but unfortunately, we did not get uh, sound to work right now here. Um, I will put it uh, online. It's a one-minute statement. I'll put it online with the slides. And it's, uh, yeah, it's very helpful. It goes in many ways. It's, it's going exactly in the direction that I want to tell you. So who am I? Some of you may already know me. I um, somehow, I, I found out in the last years that I always like dealing with danger. This is me with 19 years sleeping on top of the Mount Stromboli, an active volcano in, in, in southern Europe, behind the sign that says don't do that. That's in Serengeti some years later. You can see I also like traveling. And we camped there, and that's the sign that you could see on the tree behind me. <laughs> and, uh, and this is how my team members, some of them are here, see me. Or that's the kind of pictures they post after we have a meeting. I don't know why they think I'm dangerous, whatever. My history is I studied geography, I studied English, and a lot of other things. And uh, 20 years ago, I founded my own IT company. I had students, interns, and then I was a consultant for a self-claimed bleeding edge Linux company. Also some former colleagues of that time, Milenux, are here. And um, after that, I worked for eight years for more than eight years as a Linux journalist. I still write and still do journalism. Um, I worked as deputy edit editor-in-chief of the Linux magazine Germany. And uh, in this way, I learned how to get the, sort of the most of people over whom I do not have any power. I cannot force them. I cannot force writers to do something. I have to persuade or I have to find the common goals. And that is something that in the last years, also as a people manager, has become more and more in the focus of my life. Um, because you know, in open source, it's the same. And you can't lead an open source team with pure force. You know, the job situation, the people will leave. They get a job everywhere. So 2015, I started at SUSE with the first job as a people manager. I said before, I love traveling and I do crazy things. Just ask my team that's around. I've done, yeah. I'm a diplomat, priest, Jedi Knight, I'm a chimera, and stuff. Why do I do my stuff? I do it just for fun. This picture is, some of you may know it, it's in Finland. It's a small island where Linus Torvalds spent his summer holidays as a kid, and I visited his father here on the boat on the left, and to, uh, for, a, for an article with Linux magazine, and Linus once wrote in his book just for fun, why do we do things? We do them just for fun. And that is something that has defined my life. So that's, that's basically all, yeah, almost all for me. I had my own company, and thereby I learned important things. This is the 90s, first office, first project management, first uh, server room and um, <laughs> fan. As a consultant, I, I learned there's always different chairs you have to sit on at the same time, and you end up in between. You have users, customers, you have uh, management, you have management at a customer, you have manage your management, and they have all different views, and you have the technical view. You know what's best, technically. You might know what the customer will be happy in also two or three years, but you have your boss and you have the customer, so you end up in between the chairs. And uh, that was very important for me, because there I learned there's always a variety of truths. I've been writing lots of stuff, and lear I learned how to deal with fragile things like IT security and humans and bring them together somehow. Do you feel safe with me? Yes, great. <laughs> For the internet, they cheered. 
Would you feel safe in such a place? I felt like Simpsons there. This is in Utah, south of Provo, where Suze has one of its offices. And uh, this is Little Sahara, one of the lesser known national parks in the US, and, or nature parks, reserves. And it's, it's very nice, lots of dunes and sand, and people go there with their sand buggies, and they dig holes, obviously. And uh, when you, get, you come there and you see the sign, like, okay, thanks. And you see, security is, like Schneier said, is, it's, it's about feelings. And it's feelings versus reality. Schneier also brings in the model that we make of reality. So he says it's a triangle, feelings, model, reality. Um, Schwartau, Win Schwartau, some of you may know this old, old book, defines security as time-based. Yeah? We will have that later, for example, when you have passwords, why it doesn't make sense to, change your, to, to enforce a regular password change. Yeah? Because the time that you need to iterate through all the passwords, if you are a, a brute force hacker, is much more important than the time span in which you, on, you change your passport, password. And similar things. It's a great book. It's an, uh, I think it's from the 80s. <laughs> Still a good read. Then security in open source. It's the, the term control is something we open source people don't like that much, but only transparency gives you really the opportunity to control if, if reality has security. It's not, but it doesn't tell you anything about the feeling. The, the opposing model is security versus trust. That means security by obscurity or the proprietary software model. So you may feel security with Apple, Microsoft, whatever, but I would say this is not security. You trust them, and therefore you feel secure. And uh, there is one thing that comes in here. Schneier also talks about it. Others talk about it. We humans, we have huge problems when assessing dangers. We have great fears from dangers that won't happen every, every other minute. We, have, we are more afraid of the big things that just happen one in a million years. That's because of our human nature. Oxford Dictionary Design says security has also these two components of security in its definition, the state of being free from danger, so reality, and 1.3, the state of feeling safe, stable, and free. So this, the, you see, the feeling and reality is two components of security, and they don't match. In 2003, in a book, I wrote, security is a good feeling an admin has when he goes home in the evening, and he thinks he has done everything possible. So security theater, however, is also, I think this is also from Wikipedia, the simplest possible definition. The practice of investing in countermeasures intended to provide the feeling of improved security while doing little or nothing to achieve it. Yeah, especially the security repercussions after September 11. You may remember that. You know the TSA locks on, on your luggage. Yeah? And some of you may remember when the keys were published and you could print them or have them created. That was ac ac actually an accident because some journalist published a high resolution uh, picture of those keys. This is a blurred version of it. But so from this high resolution picture, the, the public could derive a, um, a template to really create them. But in the end, the criminal objects probably had those keys anyhow. So this was a perfect example for security theater. How do we... Nevertheless, people feel comfortable with locking their luggage. They don't think about the rest. That's just, that's just reality. <laughs> and again, the feeling secure to many people is more important than the reality. And if someone would come in, like, that's why I called it a praise of folly, because that's what Erasmus of Rotterdam already said. If someone comes in and uncovers the theater, like me sometimes, the feeling secure is totally gone. It's the Cassandra effect, yeah? It's, and then it's like quantum entanglement, yeah? The moment you point at it, it's whoosh, gone instantaneously. In corporate IT, I, a term comes to the rescue that I coined some almost 10 years ago, blameware. 
Blameware is software that is, that is being bought to um, take the blame. So usually it's software that is also not open source. It is software that comes from the outside and where the admins and the IT managers don't have the blame when something goes wrong. So that the old saying, if you buy from Siemens, IBM, um, Microsoft, whatever, big corporation, you are fine if anything goes wrong because it was, their, it was their fault and every other customer will have the same problem. It does not matter if it is realistic to get anything out of a court case, any, 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 rig, any kind of compensation, it doesn't matter. Just get the blame out of the house. I coined that in a, in a blog post to the story in 2011 uh, on the German uh, agent, the, the, the agency in Germany that um, coordinates the, the embassies all over the world, which is closely related to the Secretary of State or Foreign Ministry, Auswärtige Amt. That was a very good example for blameware. So. Blameware, how does that even, even work? Because, and that's, that's pretty easy because we have, it's not a technical decision. It is a human decision. It is an organizational decision. People want to keep their job. They want to stay in place. Who does want to stay in place? It's you, mostly management, upper management or politicians. Yeah? And this trickles down. And so I, if you, if you look in, this is also from Wikipedia, you'll find it there. We have a, we find some layers above the ones that we know as the technological layers that go from one to seven, the OSI model. On top of that, we find the user layer, or as we would say, the problem sitting in front of the screen. And, uh, this is as technical as I'm going to get. OC layers one, oh, one to eight, that's wrong. One to seven is technical. Hardware, applications, and incoming data travels from, incoming data travels this way. Outgoing data travels this way. Level eight is the user. Level nine are all organizations. Like your company, the company you're work, working for, the management, the company itself, the corporations. And level 10 is politics. We can discuss this. In some places, corporations are so big and so powerful that they will be on level 10. And the politics is just level 9. But as Julia would have said in her video, she said, the great misconception that we have as open source, or one of the misunderstandings that, that uh, IT geeks may have is that they think politicians don't know anything about open source and concepts and stuff. She says, no, that's not really the case. In far more situations, those, 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 the, the politicians know about it, but they have different mindsets or concepts. So they, far, more, far more often they think the market will fix it. So if open source is superior or whatever, then the market will fix it and it will, re will, re will replace the old model software that we have. Well, let's see. I, I, I know that it is true when it comes to politicians, but I don't believe in that model. So two questions for, for you to think about or ponder that I think is, are very interesting, but I have not made up my mind fully to that. An article by Jeremy Lenz suggests that corporations are analog artificial intelligence, while an article from Tim O'Reilly says a system like Wall Street dominated finan financial market capitalism is an analog, the first analog super intelligence that we created. Just some food for thought, yeah? Okay, what are, now we have, the, we have seen, let me go back, we saw the stage and the players in the game, and now we see the intentions of the actors. Politicians want to be re-elected. These are what I think and based on my experience, the most important um, intentions of the players. Correct me if I'm wrong. Politicians want to be re-elected. Corporations want to make money, or have, or more money. And you can always rely on that. Managers, managers want you, us, to do what they need to make 
more money to make a career or to satisfy their boss up the ladder, up the food chain. And the user, yeah, that's sometimes, uh, not, no, not sometimes. Very often we find people who say, oh, I don't want to change, I just want to do my job. I'm fine if I can go home in the evening and just let me do my job in a, in a very, in a comfortable way and I'm fine and everything is good. So they don't want to change, they don't want to stress, they don't want to learn, they want simple solutions that integrate with my habits. And you will lose me after th the third sentence of an explanation. I need simple and understandable solutions, like Apple offers. Think different. Yeah? So I know this is a little bit negative, and I know there's many users out there that are different, but... And this, this, this is us. I mean, most of you know the plonk hashtag, right? That's when the head hits the table. <laughs> and uh, it's, we need more, that's why I'm giving this talk and I found myself in, into more and more the, the, the API between techies and, and uh, other people. We need more um, understanding and talking and explaining to normal people also about the concepts. Because we find ourselves in the triangles where only in a, tri in a triangle where only two corners where only one of are possible. So we can have software or systems or anything that can be secure, fast, or usable, but you can't have all three of them. You can have two. Yeah? You can have secure, software that's secure, fast, and cheaply developed. No, you can have two of the three. And there's many triangles like that around. So what are the plots and mechanisms? In the security theater game again, someone will try to sell you some strange kind of sausage. Those who know Pratchett know what I'm talking about. Um, it also comes as, we can help you, this snake oil is perfect for you. Then there's, give us all your data and you won't have to worry. Just recently again, in Bavar the Bavarian National State Party now wants to go for Free data, free your data, Everybody, they, everybody's data belong to everybody. We call it Datenreichtum. They really took that word into their program. <laughs> um, the same, one of the plots is we need more control because everybody wants job security. Then we have the trust me, I know what I'm doing thing. If you stick with us, you are safe. I told you already that if security theater is uncovered, then the trust is destroyed, but the customers will need new products. <laughs> so best thing is shoot the messenger before he tells anybody. Also one of the wonderful management anti-patterns. And I don't have a clock here, just keep me good. I'm almost good halfway through. Um, the masks, disguises, or costumes that come in is uh, also a very interesting field, and you will have to do some research because I have not, don't have the time to tell you all about it. But it's especially management anti-patterns, wonderful. You know Wamfi or Wamft with a T at the end? Wamfi or Yamfi is yet another meeting will fix it. <laughs> I love that! <laughs> And the conference bingo spreadsheet is around in the internet for a long time where you can, the first one who has all the fields yells bingo and the fields are like, can you hear me? Are you there? You just dropped out. I'm sorry, whatever, you know these things, yeah? Um, then we have consultants. It's the anthropomorphic personification of blameware sometimes. I've done that job. Um, we have coders. Do you know onion code? You get a blob, like a binary blob or whatever, and it throws out error messages. Yeah? And you don't know the hell what these error messages are from. So what do you do? This thing won't run, you get the error message. You write a wrapper around it that just, just, just works on and pushes, <laughs> ignores the error message. This is not yet onion code, this is just a wrapper. But once the next developer comes and has another error message, he will make another shell. And this is how the blob grows with lots and lots of shells around it, and that's how the, the onion grows. 
We often, or many of us, have been telling users, well, you can't protect against the NSA, so why worry at all? That's completely wrong. Or the ignorant, have you tried turning it off and on again? Or like, you know the red button, this chain is the internet. Obviously, you know IT crowd. Um, on the other hand, we have a, I call, this is not, I'm not calling all the users fools here. I have to be precise. But the fool is um, also in, in the classical theater is a role here. Yeah? And the art of complaining. My computer is a mess. The software never works. Why is the network software login always so slow? The anti-patterns to, to that is it works on my machine. <laughs> or I'll put it in a container. I learned in the last years that we Europeans tend to socialize through complaining. This is an art that the people in Franconia and Oberpfalz, where I come from, have uh, really augmented to a high degree. And I know that it is not that way in America. I learned that. But this is, this is some, there's some cultural differences also. Oh, OK. So now the painful part comes. Our problem is we have cognitive bias. This is a wonderful sheet with the link here. Um, all of that is bias that we have in our head, cognitive bias. That means this is uh, opinions, attitudes that we are sure of. I am very sure that all of you share my opinion. Of course, why not? No, don't tell me. It's, it, it is like that. And um, it is the I want to believe. And that comes from evolution and because we are tribal. So we. We try to see the world around us in small groups of the same opinion, and we, we, we just classify that. There's a lot of them. And in this image, we have on one side too much information. What should we remember? We need to act fast. Not enough meaning. Have a look at it. There's a lot of them. And that makes um, memes more prone to be accepted by us. And I have some real-life memes that I don't want to discuss, just you know the discussions from the internet. One thing is bicycle helmets. With the argumentation that bicycle helmets help, every housewife, every houseman should wear a helmet and every pedestrian because they are much more prone to deadly injuries. And there are statistical proofs about it, but a huge discussion. Um, another one, great discussion that I don't want to start here, but code of conduct. I totally understand that with American law and American freedom of speech, their code of conduct are absolutely necessary in the US, but in Europe, we have a completely different law. I have not seen a code of conduct that would not specify anything that is not covered by German law. But not the problem. The problem is, do we reach the ones we want to address? The guys who misbehave, do they really stop misbehaving because there's a code of conduct? I have sincere doubts, but same thing, the war on drugs. Anybody from Portugal here? Yeah, they got this, their country got a different approach to uh, drug abuse, and it's, it's successful. Talk to them, ask them. It's not like we need to fight it to the end. Um, anybody here from London? Correct me, I have heard yesterday that the London CCTV system is on sale because it doesn't work. So, yes, true, this is crazy, but it doesn't, it doesn't work. So, the countries that have the biggest video surveillance in Europe have the most terrorist attacks in the last years. Well, it doesn't work. The same, and here we have the pseudoscience. Lie detectors, polygraphs, have been proved that they don't work. And you... <laughs> this all not, these are not my jokes. I, now you get it, huh? <laughs> These are not my jokes, these are jokes from, from the internet. But we are thinking about so many different things in terms of security that we forget the obvious often. I wrote an article in 2012 about, with a, with a renowned uh, Swiss hacker, Gunnar Porada, and, uh, he sh and we were at a conference from banks and they really told everybody, yeah, use mobile tan, use your smartphone, that's fine. We know it's not secure, but it's not being exploited. We'll tell you when it's being exploited. Then we'll bring in the, the safe systems. <sighs> One more. This is from the German Secretary of State of, of uh, Finances. 
Mr. Schäuble, the fingerprint. He said the famous sentence, my fingerprint is available for everybody. And the Chaos Computer Club Germany said, yes, it is here. Well, we publish it. <laughs> At Linux Magazine, we printed it on cups. <laughs> but this is genius. <laughs> you just need the right oil so you can stamp his fingerprint on every... <laughs> it's a product. And that's also genius. The Internet in Things, what could happen? <laughs> it's brilliant. And for those who haven't seen the first episode of the last South Park season, watch it and turn off your Alexa, Google, whatever devices, because they will go mad. They even created a loop where, um, where the... the the devices talk to each other infinitely until you switch them off. <laughs> there is a Simon Says function in Google, in, the, in Google's device, I think, uh, somehow. Just watch it, it's great. And you got 15 orders on your Amazon shopping list after the program. <laughs> Very politically incorrect. I can't repeat it. You may have seen the Hawaii missile alert last week or two weeks ago, but what you di probably haven't, didn't realize that um, the poor guy couldn't deactivate the alarm because he had lost his Twitter password. <laughs> so the login details. So see, perfect security theater, if it depends on one password, it's wrong. But as long as we have governments, the top level interfering, and uh, we, ju we just heard, if, it, if, the, if, it, if encryption is not enough for the bad guys, it's not enough for the good guys, wonderful, wonderful. So, what, what, as long as we have governments who try to mess with our, our encryption or our devices, well, thank God they also do stupid things. You may know that. Good. Um, this is Masa al-Sharif, a military base in uh, Afghanistan, and it's um, secret. The exact layout of the base is secret. Thank God there's Fitbit and soldiers like to train. <laughs> so the Fitbit devices uh, showed they're running. Uh, Shodan, I think some of you may know Shodan. He found out that ships uh, use satellite link routers that are um, configured with a standard password like our DSL routers were some years ago. And so he got hold of, so and then he found out, that, correct me if I'm wrong, the satellite network is pretty easy. You see the other partners in, in the network, it's like a network segment. And then he did a Perl script. And this is the number of ships he controlled when I took the screenshot, 108,000 <laughs> commercial ships. Yeah? And then he took a DEFCON map, a DEFCON map, and you can zoom into the map and find the ships. I, I also found a, um, a gas station. And uh, the gas station has uh, sensors for the, for the gas tanks, for the temperature. So if you can fake that, the heating will go on or the cooling system. So that's all just horrible. But if you think that antivirus software may protect us, um, you might be wrong too. Even if you think that it's not the Russians. But... <laughs> Even in 2016, we could see that antivirus software itself was a threat and had lots, lots of exploits possible and lots of um, vulnerabilities. And in the wake of the, my researches for the, for the hacking of the German parliament for the article, I found documents that where the BSI boss, that is like the German NIST, said to the politicians that don't worry, antivirus software can only catch 40% of the possible attacks. So, hmm? cyber, cyber, right? <laughs> and this is pretty recent, November. It is, uh, by definition, a very good way of getting into somebody else's computer. There's people out there who don't have a PDF engine on their computer for good reason, but the antivirus software brings it in. You know, this is one of my favorite sentences from Chaos Computer Club. The Germans will know the two terms, BR and the email. 
So years ago, the German government tried to install a secure email system. They failed with it, and uh, it took years to get it to make it secure. And in the end, they defined it as secure by politics. They said this system now is secure. <laughs> and that's where Linus Neumann from Chaos Computer Club came with a sentence on one of the CCC conferences: "For every technical problem, there is a political solution." In comes. Das besondere Anwaltspostfach, so a special emailing service for German lawyers. Yeah, and they, they picked it up and they, they ah, there's such a long list of mistakes, starting with making a, a, starting a web server on the client to, set, to, to, to be reachable from the server. But to, to do this, they had to copy the private key on the client of the CA. <laughs> And that's only the beginning. They had old Java libraries, so the web server was also running, I think, Java. And they had Java, old Java, Java libraries with lots and lots of vulnerabilities, and they, they had to turn it off again. And it's, this is um, a satire on, on their advertisement. It's, it's German. It says, simple, digital, broken. The company, in this case, we have a, a company behind it that is well-known and big. And if you have been dealing with, uh, with administrations, politici political stuff, then you will have run into them. If you're from Britain, you know them because they were, their IT was um, yeah, involved in the NHS scandal. And uh, it's ATOS in this case. They've been doing lots of stuff in Germany, but they are, it's, just, uh, uh, it's just one example. There, there's many companies out there who make money like this, and that's because the politics allows them and gives them the, the possibility to do that. And one of the insiders told me then, this company is just too big to not fail. <laughs> it's just an example. The problem is, and I have this book here, this is wonderful, Skada and Me, and it says, a book for children and management. Yeah? <laughs> and this is Robert M. Lee, and this is wonderful. This is, uh, what is the time? Can you tell me? Ooh, okay. Um, this was written by a university, um, U.S. Air Force cyberspace operations officer and a children's book animator. SCADA, some of you may know, is an architecture for controlling machines in, in uh, production. And uh, this is so from inside the book. So this guy explains it to the child. The child is asking question. Can these people protect SCADA for me? No, they are confused. You must protect it yourself. The author quotes are wonderful. Problem is, a lot of effort is focused on big attention-grabbing attacks. It's rare for a state to launch such a big attack. Yeah? And the basic security measures are not in place at the same time. And such, the, the, the most probable attacks are very simple, and it is very simple to protect against them. But many people are focusing on the big ones, and that's just wrong. And that is because. A lot of people who go on about cyber war just want job security and big contracts. Okay, I'm jumping over my recent articles about passwords, because I only have 10 minutes left, I was told. told that's an article in IX, German magazine. Um, when you use passwords, you should never, just one thing, never reuse a password. Huh? Ask yourself if you trust the service. and. Um, I don't know if you trust the password manager. I know I will get bitched for that, but usually your apartment in this world today and a sheet of paper in your apartment at home is a much safer place than any computer you might have for your password. It's not usable, okay? I know that. It's not very user-friendly. Your safe is even better. But and the only two things that matter when you come to a password is length and entropy. And don't reuse it. Same applies to the darknet. If you're in the darknet, my article, You'll be safe for a few minutes if you use the right setup, but after that, at least the advertisement industry, Google, whatever, will know who you are. Because you, human error and social hacking are your enemies, and that is you. I gave a radio interview just a few days ago about that. <laughs> that's, that's all from the internet. That's not my creation. I'm a disclaimer, yeah? And a book from 1850, Meltdown Spectre, yeah? I came 
into responsible or irresponsible disclosure topics with Meltdown Spectre as a journalist. And I found a quote from a book from 1850 that says, it is to the interest of honest persons to know about insecurities because the dishonest are tolerably, toler tolerably certain to be the first to apply the knowledge practically. 1850, one of the foundation books of lock making. This is a study from 1995, paid for by the NSA or under the auspices of the NSA, that said the X86 architecture, um, where is it? Is, yeah, it, undesirable for secure systems because of potential security and reliability problems. Guess what's in there? It's 1995, but nobody cares. So, those were the painful examples. What can we do to better the situation? Today, the internet is uh, controlled by four big companies. And that is, in my opinion, and as others say, uh, a direct outcome of the invisible hand is directing the market, meaning we are doing nothing, we haven't done anything, and so we are stuck with Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon. I think we need somehow liability for software mistakes and such embedded in hardware. I know it's a controversial topic. But I, I, I'm from Germany. Will, will Volkswagen get away with it? Will Intel get away with it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you see? Yes? <laughs> I don't know. Um, of course, I, this, is, this is all just for discussion. I am open for ideas and anything to change my mind. This is just what I think about at the moment. Um, lawmakers have to define rules. Open source software has, of course, to play a bigger role. It is no guarantee for security, but you all know there's no security without it. I want to stress the, the, the campaign from the FSFE, public money, public code. You think about, if we introduce software liability as a society, we could decide to exempt open source from it. So telling a company, if you publish your code, you will not be liable because then we know what we get. And that is a good argument against the standard argument about software liability, that politicians or whoever says, you will kill all the small software companies if you make them liable. Huh? We can say, okay, they should do, let them do open source. There's business models. It works. And make open source mandatory for certified secure infrastructure and environments. And another thing I suggest is certify user hardware and software. That's also very debatable, I think, but many German conservative politics, politicians talk about the data highway because they hear that there's packets and parcels going around and there is a lot of traffic and then they think of a highway. And so I tried to get the, the traffic meme or concept in here. So let's, let's think about how we handle traffic on roads. Yeah, we have the cars, we have the software in the cars in the meantime. Um, we have liability to the owner and the driver. So if the dri in Germany at least it is like that. If you have an accident, the driver cannot be found. The owner is liable to a certain degree. So we have the cars are checked every two years in Germany. The drivers have a driving license. The software, is there any checks for software being used in cars in Germany or wherever? I don't know, I haven't, I haven't heard of that. Obviously, it's not open source and that's therefore not really checked. And off the grid, where all of that is, you have racetracks or amusement parks or off-grid tracks or private ground and communities where you're not tied to these kinds of certifications. It, driving your car is sort of guaranteed anonymous except for the number plate. But again, CCTV or in Germany, toll collect the system. Um, is severely attacking that and conservative powers are attacking that. So the fear is there, it, this is prone to control. And if we think about any system like that for the internet, that might make the internet less anonymous. I understand that. I just want to give, I just want to start a discussion on that. And the image, the meme works. As you can see, just a few days ago, a, a cyclist uh, slowed down car traffic outside the FCC building to demonstrate against net neutrality. If a car driver gives him $5, he would let him pass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
We have one more problem in security politics that is the ratchet. Ratchet is this Stellrad, you know, or I like to, it's a one way street, or I like to, this is a cut through through a zip tie. Um, at the moment, our security politics always tightens, 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 tightens. It never goes back. We never reverse. We never release. Yeah? So that's why I want sunset clauses in any security related laws. Sunset clause means this law will be in power for a year or two or whatever, and there is checks and a goal that we want to reach. If we don't reach that goal after a year, the law will be gone. Because we, we are humans, we are making stupid mistakes, we are making stupid laws and whatever. So I think we need something like that. And on top of that, they should be mandatory if anything is security related. I'm not a lawmaker, no, nor am I a politician. But I think this is something we should really start to think about. Because otherwise we'll just end up in, in getting closer to 1984 or any other dystopian state. And I think this is my last slide. Until then, I like to say that to nerds, common sense is not witchcraft. <laughs> anything, against who do you want to protect? Your people, your company, whatever. Always remember, you will need a secret service if you want to protect against the secret service. Full stop. And if you ever heard of the Pareto rule, Pareto is a management rule. It says 80% is enough. You want the last 20%, the closer you get to 100% to achieve of any kind of solution, the more expensive and the more yeah, expensive in any way it gets. So common sense and realization this must be enough this is enough no well to the managers and politicians do your homework create the goals reviews and checks and enforce them to the users this is our task also to make it clear that they have to be ready to learn again and again this is against human nature because we all want to settle down as old, the older we get the more we just want to settle down and oh, not, not nothing new again and we have to install a culture of errors and mistakes. This is something that I love about SUSE, I have to say, because we have, we have a culture of errors and mistakes. It is good if somebody does a mistake because we learn out of that. If the, if, mistake happens for, if the same mistake happens for three or four times, then we have a discussion. But um, try things, do a mistake, that's how we learn. And install a culture of that. Open source is mandatory for security, and there's no security without. And that would have been the video from Julia. Not all politicians are stupid or ignorant of open source. Some really know, but they just don't care, and they have different business models. Whew, that was a point landing, I guess, huh? Questions possible? Oh, okay. Uh very sorry, but uh, we ran out of time. You ran out of time, so there are no questions I didn't have a possible clock here, I'm sorry. here in, this, uh, um, in this auditorium. But perhaps you have time to answer any here. question or start any discussion outside. Thank you very much. Thank you.